So welcome everybody. I want to start by introducing our moderator for the day, um, Evan Mallet. Now, Evan Mallet is the chef owner of Black Trumpet Restaurant in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. He's also a good friend of mine. And so I asked him if he would be willing to come in and moderate this session. Uh, his restaurant is dedicated to biodiversity and building a resilient community around local food and social justice. Evan is a six-time James Beard semifinalist for Best Chef Northeast. He has logged over a decade sitting on the boards of Chefs Collaborative, Slow Food Seacoast, my local chapter, and the Heirloom Harvest Project, which is an initiative that brings together farmers, chefs, and educators to identify and restore a food system native to the greater New England Seacoast region. In 2016, Evan wrote an award-winning book published by Chelsea Green Publishing entitled Black Trumpet, A Chef's Journey Through Eight New England Seasons. This is a really cool book. It's got recipes and stories to go with it. And then in 2017, Evan partnered with a farmer, Josh Jennings, to create Abundance, which is a company that produces and packages soups and sauce from uh, surplus or our ugly farm produce. And during the pandemic, he converted his kitchen two days a week to a production facility for meals to our local um, food distribution or food pantry uh, gather and it helping to feed food insecure families in Southern New Hampshire and Maine. And he lives in Southern Maine. So welcome, Evan. And with that, I'm going to head out. I'm gonna remind you again, please do not kick, click to share your screen or video because we're not going to, we're only gonna have the panelists and um, speakers on camera during this session. Hello, Phil. Hey. Bill is going to be our co-moderator today. And Bill, I have a shout out for you because Bill is the director of preservation at Seed Savers Exchange. And he leads the team there tasked with managing the vast collection of over 20,000 open pollinated varieties. He has a um, master's and a PhD in horticultural sciences from the University of Florida. And luckily for you all watching the summit, Bill knows everyone in the seed world. No, that's not true. Okay, almost everyone. And with, but without Phil, we would not be having this. But you're, yeah, the, for everyone, you're seeing me right now because um, Ira was having some tech issues. So I'm going to be sharing my screen um, when Ira is here and I'm going to be presenting. And so there may be some little bit of delay here and there between Ira talking and me switching the, the screen. So just, just to let you know. So um, again, just a reminder, please do not ask to share your screen during this session. Uh, for some reason, it seems to be telling you to do that, but um, you're just gonna be watching from outside in the chat. And with that, I am going to depart and let Evan uh, start the first session. Thank you, Allison. And um, now we're gonna say a few words about Allison behind her back as she has just left. Um, but I promised her that uh, we would make sure that we uh, do justice to her efforts that brought this uh, seed summit to life um, in, in collaboration with Jeff. Uh, but Allison, her backstory, uh, and I know we want to get to Ira, but uh, it, it, it must be said that Allison has been tirelessly working to make this happen. Um, and I know her personally from our uh, Slow Food chapter in the Seacoast area. She started out in Portland, Oregon. Uh, she's always been about good, fair, and clean. And whether it was her upbringing there where she ate dirt at age four and has been connected to the soil ever since, or if it was uh, her college uh, career where she pursued cooperation and collaboration around the ideas of uh, the values in farming uh, that are a basic human right. Uh, her love of plants has guided her along the way and become an advocate for the clean alternatives of organic farming uh, without chemicals and uh, she is the one who started with a few other people, our local seafood, cha uh, slow food Seacoast chapter, as I mentioned, and she ran that for 15 years. So I just want to send her a, a shout out and applause and thank you, uh, Allison, for making this uh, event possible. So with that, uh, I think, let me see, are we, Phil, do we have Ira, is she able to hear us? Yeah, I think we just need Ira to pop on in. Okay. Well, while she's uh, in the process of doing that, let me... Oh, there she is. Hi, Ira. 
Hi. I'm about to, I'm about to pop. I, just say, I didn't think I was in charge of letting me pop in. <laughs> no, we do have to pop ourselves in and out, it seems. Um, so welcome, and everyone who's here uh, to hear from Ira, I just want to give you a little background um, on this amazing human being. I've done some research and gotten to know her a little bit through previous conversations, and I'm so impressed. Um, Ira's a worker owner of the cooperative Southern, Expo Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. I'm a longtime customer and fan. Um, and you're gonna see links pop up in the chat room for many of these uh, affiliations of IRAs. So you can do your own research on the side or after this session. Um, for those who don't know Southern Exposure, they offer over 700 varieties of open pollinated heirloom organic seeds, and they've been uh, selected for flavor and regional adaptability. Southern Exposure also uh, helps People keep control of their food supply by supporting sustainable home and market gardening, seed saving, preserving heirloom varieties, something that's very sacred to me. Um, Ira serves on the boards of Organic Seed Alliance, the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. And in addition, uh, she's a member of Acorn Community, which is uh, a farm of over 60 acres, certified organic in central Virginia, growing seeds, alliums, hay, uh, conducting variety trials also for Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. Uh, she's an organizer of the Heritage Harvest Festival at Monticello. And we'll be hearing, I'm sure, a little bit about that. Uh, she also writes uh, prolifically about heirloom vegetable varieties for magazines and blogs, including Mother Earth, Fine Gardening, and Southern Exposure. She conducts variety trials for SESE, as well as researching and documenting the history of varieties that are offered in their annual catalog. And she has a book, um, maybe two actually. She has uh, the Timber Press Guide to Vegetable Gardening in the Southeast and a new state specific book series include, including Grow Great Vegetables in Virginia. They're both available online and we're gonna post those links and you can find them at booksellers everywhere. So with that, uh, we're going to now uh, sit back and listen to Ira Wallace uh, talk about uh, her backstory and the body of her work that is so inspiring. Uh, good afternoon. I'm so glad you all decided to come and spend the afternoon with me. We're going to talk about seed keeping, which is a little bit different than seed saving. It is seed saving plus saving the story uh, and uh, the culinary history and recipes and all those things that make uh, a variety important to people in a certain time and place uh, change. Can you change slides? <laughs> Hello. Ah, uh, yes. Well, we're going to have a little delay. Uh, <laughs> I got nervous here. Uh, I put this slide up because one of the things that I realized a couple of years ago is I've been in this seed saving business for a long time and I only knew about a few black variety, black held and certain varieties in particular. More about the whole story of black people and food in this country. And I realized I had a total blind spot to the fact that the reason I didn't really know these stories is because they weren't so much a part of the written history. And you had to search deeper to look at what uh, people who were in, in the Southeast in particular contributed to making what has become just American cuisine of the South uh, change slides. Uh, and that often been able to be held by that family because of uh, not only the discontinuities that happened in slavery itself. Uh, during reconstruction that happened again during the great migrations in, 
uh, between the 50s and 80s in the United States. So uh, they're just things, big things. Like when you think about extent, strongly by black universities that really needed to help uh, these uh, farmers be able to be successful uh, and you 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 sort of well I mean I, I went to some black schools so I heard a little bit about George Weston and Carver and uh, Booker T really so much I learned a whole lot more uh, you know about the history of white uh, farmers and I was a person of color so today we're just looking a little bit to put that background there for us and to tell a few stories because really I love telling stories about uh, varieties change slides uh, one probably I think the next one is one that I really want to put there that's me when you think about who were those homesteaders uh, in the, you know, hippie 60s and 70s and early 80s who made this new seed saver movement that a lot of people are. And there I was. We were also wanting to get closer to our food. And uh, yeah, I couldn't resist. I found that one. It was so old fashioned. I had to bring it there. And now I work in a group that's largely on our farm here uh, in Virginia, white, so a few people of color like myself, but change the slide. But in terms of the farmers that we work with, it is a much more diverse uh, group. And I think part of that uh, reason that more people who are not white can move and grow organic food with us is really uh, the safety net that people have behind them should they take the risk of becoming a, a farmer. And the black farmers that we work with, uh, some of them are third generation farmers. Uh, many of them have gone through the loop of dealing with heirs pro property and some of the um, real problems that there happened with the interpretation of the USDA rules about financing and so forth. Hopefully that we're coming to a time when those things will be one of uh, is Nicola uh, and we're helping uh, her and all the friends in Jamaica with being able to try to start uh, a, an organic seed company there. Change. Oops. <laughs> ah, and here's our friends at True Love Seed who are uh, working with very s small uh, growers in city gardens and so forth to bring uh, varieties that are not only from uh, Black people in the U.S., but from the African uh, diaspora and uh, we're not to they're not totally prejudiced against white people. You're allowed to <laughs> bring European heirlooms too that are important. And uh, I particularly love these folks because they're a big voice giving a shout out that the story of food in America is uh, really something uh like in the southeast where i am it's where the european food tradition and culture the african uh food uh history and all of the varieties that had come from the americas by native american people and gone to europe and other and come back again even were a part of making that uh, cuisine. Next picture. And, you know, I know this is supposed to be about food. You know where we're going to get Watermelons are one of those things 
that uh, came from Africa and that came very important in Southeast. Uh, I just, uh, you want to click so my one PowerPoint trick can show? <laughs> These heirloom seeds. <laughs> you all know what they are. Uh, they are non hybrid seeds that are open pollinated. And you really want to remember that about heirloom that they are uh, open pollinated seeds that you can save your seed from. And uh, many of them are things that we're familiar with, but many are rare and unusual. And something that you can do uh, as a eater and a gardener is find open new open pollinated or heirloom open pollinated that you treasure and start to save seeds because if you look at uh the records in the seed savers exchange so many of those varieties were really held by one thing by people in a very small area and they if they had not and their families have not maintained those, we wouldn't be enjoying so many of these wonderful things. And those are a few, uh, you know, watermelons, the moon and stars, one of my favorites. I didn't actually stick a picture of it up there, but Odell's White is one of the ones that had, you know, as a footnote, it, uh, farmer who put it, where it uh, won, and it was said to be uh, developed by the Sumners in South Carolina. But as a, as actually, it it was a chance mutation that had been nurtured by an African American while well, they uh, enslaved, possibly or possibly free person, and then grown on the Sumner Foundation. And those are the no, the kind of footnotes about varieties that are important uh, and how uh, black people contributed to them, but you don't even know the person's name. Uh, was one notation that maybe was a fellow named Harry who uh, was of many of the garden, the Sumner plantation, but we don't really know. Uh, and what it takes to know those stories is a lot of resources. Um, there's some, you know, uh, could you get to the next slide? I'm not used to this next slide business. <laughs> could you do the next one? Uh, and really, uh, this heirloom business that we have is uh, not, could you click that? I don't know. I tried to make a trick, but it didn't work. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, putting, you know, some of the things about uh, the heirlooms, because I was going to try to start out by telling you why these wonderful varieties, we want to keep them and uh, save the seeds ourselves. Uh, but let's go on since I made, made you wait so long. Uh, and I and I had to put in uh, one reference to things that are happening now that are affecting people in this country and throughout the world with the consolidation in the seed industry and the interest that we have and the time that we put into uh, supporting uh, the preservation of heirloom genetics is something that uh, will be important, perhaps uh, with even more important with climate change, change the picture. And uh, this poster, if you're ever talking about uh, what are some of the dangers to our food system will really help you. Uh, another group of people who I wanted to are Native Americans. And one of the groups that we work with uh, quite a bit of the Cherokees in North Carolina and uh, this white eagle flower corn, which dries down to black ears, uh, was one of the first collaborations we had with uh, 
uh, Chief uh, Kevin came and his wife came to look at our bean collection to look at and see if we had some October beans. And it came up that we had this uh, white eagle uh, corn that we had got actually from Tony West. And he, they, he thought it was looking for, for. So we increased that and donated uh, stock to the tribe. And then the next year they grew 400 pounds of corn and distributed it to all the members of the tribe who were interested. And especially uh, they had a, a 4-H group there that took it and uh, really increased it and made it once again a regularly used product on the reservation rather than an endangered variety. And um, it kind of that was 20 some years ago, and it was the beginning of trying uh, to where we can, re what they call nowadays, rematriate or give back varieties that uh, have belonged to native people or to people in a certain, uh, you know, area that uh, like with the collared project that we're working with uh, now. Uh, could you change the slide? Speaking of, uh, we got inspired to do this because I thought of, you know, collards as a, a quintessential African-American variety. What I didn't know until I met uh, Ed Davis was how many different kind of collards there were and how many, how much uh, it was some, uh, in particular for uh, poor people in the South, uh, a real, still uh, a disappearing but real uh, variety that is saved by many people. Could you change the slide? Uh, and uh, Mark Farnham collected almost 90 accessions of heirloom collards uh, and donated the seeds to the USDA. And this picture actually is from the first time I went to the USDA ARAC in Charleston and Mark Farnham was growing out a bunch of varieties uh, from that collection. And I got to see uh, the real diversity in heirloom collars. And uh, fortunately, uh, Dr. Farnham and uh, Davis shared this with me. And one of the things, uh, and our friends at Seed Savers Exchange, when we talked to them about uh, this, they also were excited, so excited that, uh, that they used their weight to get the USDA to uh, give samples of 60 of the varieties that had been collected by them. And uh, that first year grew out pretty much all of them and described them and took pictures of them. Uh, and next slide. There's some more. I, I think that, that what I wanted to show you know, is you go to the grocery store and there's just only those green collards, but these uh, collards, you know, represent so much more diversity uh, that we really have liked it. And one of the exciting things for me was uh, we identified some, could you go to the next slide, some African-American stewarded varieties. And the first, uh, oops, well, this is some a few of the things that you can do uh, to help out uh, with the Collard Project, but it was actually, I'm going to skip over that and tell you those while we look at these people. Can we do the next one? I wanted to actually uh, tell the story of uh, a group 
of African-American sorority sisters led by Lorraine Mortise, who's an attorney uh, and a novice gardener and her friend Elmer Kesey and all of her sorority sisters who happened not to be there when they were sending off their first uh, seeds from uh, the variety that they had uh, taken on to store to go uh, to see to every exchange. And uh, as I understand that variety, William Alexander heading was also included in a, a collection that Seeds Ever sent to Svalbard to be uh, preserved in the global uh, seed bank there. And I, I don't know. The, the thoughts that, you know, getting good jobs, that uh, farming and gardening were not for black people, uh, part of the good life, what, it was totally turned over when I saw these sorority ladies uh, and their uh, middle class uh, black uh, seed saver friend come together to be able to regenerate this uh, traditionally black sturdy variety. And let's see a picture of it in the next slide. It's one of those uh, North Carolina varieties. They, uh, you know, call them cabbage collards because they had a bit uh, at the top. And <laughs> that wire was because as the plants were getting bigger at the end, various critters, uh, not just insects were starting to come in and have lunch. So uh, that was one of the ways that they uh, protected those precious plants. Um, next slide. Oh, ah, and here's a story. This is a Soko Yokoto uh, African Celosia. We think of Celosias as a really an ornamental plant here in this country, but in parts of Africa, there are 30 to 60 uh, various greens that grow wild that are uh, really treasured as a part of uh, spring tonic and, uh, and throughout the season to give know, various traditional dishes. And um, one, of, uh, one of our seed growers uh, has brought this variety uh, to us and we have been offering it in our Southern Exposure catalog. And it, it takes us back to uh, what that, that tradition of using so many different uh, uh, these of dark leafy greens might be one of the reasons that uh, collards in in the variety that I only in recent years learned existed were treasured uh, by many of uh, the newly enslaved African people and uh, grown. Uh, and and maintained in their in their food ways. Uh, can we see the next one? Uh, oh, and there's another uh, variety that uh, type of vegetable that doesn't get very much respect, but that again played a very big role uh, in maintaining uh, the health and nutrition of uh, black people both during slavery and uh, in the years of reconstruction. And actually, and people love them now, and those are what we call Crowder peas or black eyed peas. Uh, and uh, there's Tuskegee Institute for the newly freed uh, black people 
our Negro people, as we were called at that time, uh, taught them that this is something that you can grow to enrich the soil as well as provide food uh, for yourself and for your animals. And even the leaves are edible. They're not in this country used too much, but uh, yeah. Could you change the slide? Uh, and I told you that some of our farmers uh, are uh, multi-generational farmers. You want to do the second one? Slade here uh, is one of our farmers. He actually was uh, an extension uh, worker uh, and teacher and researcher. And uh, some 10 years ago now, I started talking to him about organic gardening. And he, uh, could you, I mean, change the slide or click it. Uh, he, um, <laughs> and this, this, this is another of uh, the family. And the reason I wanted to bring it up is now Clifton has become a stalwart teacher about sustainable and organic uh, methods. attaining one of the uh, most sustainable uh, farms in the eastern shore of Virginia that I know of. And he gives all kinds of classes and has, uh, you know, for how to grow. And he grows a lot of traditional crops, but he says, you know, some of the old and some of the new so that you can have uh, what eaters want but at the same time, take advantage of what growers know how to do. Uh, and if you could change the slide. Uh, Cliff specializes in sweet potatoes. He grows some 25 different uh, types of heirloom sweet potatoes. And we uh, went to visit his farm and they hadn't dug any sweet potatoes. He just dug up just this one hill and look at all those beautiful tubers waiting. Mm -mm, delicious. Uh, uh, anyway, Cliff uh, and his family are always uh, looking for the varieties that their family and their grandparents grew. He says, unfortunately, there was a moment between when they were all so busy going off to college that they for a minute forgot uh, you know, about maintaining some of the varieties and didn't realize that, uh, <laughs> oh my, somebody, somebody said, okay, forget those colors, move on to the sweet potatoes. <laughs> I think you're right. Uh, and sweet, the, the thing that's really nice about when you're, um, the heirloom sweet potatoes is you see that when, uh, people were growing what was a little bit easier in the types of soils and with the high levels of moisture that we have here is uh, there were white sweet potatoes that were less sweet that you could use in savory dishes and uh, but also you know sweeter ones and uh, you know that you could use for desserts uh, ones that had you know, more, uh, more of those purple ones. The one, what do they call it? Uh, there's a, a Stokes purple or something that they sell in markets. Well, you know, even the people who have that uh, patent uh, on that plant say they got it from a local person and just grew it for a few years and then uh, made it uh, got a utility patent because it's so distinctive when they had done nothing but take what had been being maintained in, in the local community. Ah, and the other one, uh, there, 
are seeds. And uh, this is the kind of jars that we like to bring to a seed swap. And that might be a, a jar from our friend uh, Roger Wen in Little Mountain, South Carolina, whose uh, family, uh, may, his wife's family maintain Odell uh, white uh, watermelon, which is one of these great big old, you know, 25, 35 pound uh, watermelons. Uh, and even that I like about uh, Roger is he, I, I think sometimes, you know, of, you know, who keeps up the stories and talks about uh, the mixed roots of our seeds in the area is he, uh, who was named Seed Saver of the Year in South Carolina, is always raising up that in his part of, of South Carolina, that among the seed saving families, the black families and some of the native families and the white families that uh, are maintaining these traditional varieties have helped each other and exchange seeds uh, as long as they have records, some of which are written back into the 1800s. And uh, it was uh, really interesting because I, sort of have a different idea of how life is for everyone in South Carolina. And certainly Little Mountain might not be uh, the way it is everywhere, but that uh, another part of the untenable story of uh, how people uh, get into there. And I am so glad somebody mentioned Michael's Twitty, the cooking game, Michael Twitty, uh, is an African American uh, Jewish gay outrageous food writer and courageous uh, researcher and uh, extremely informative writer who wrote this book, The Cooking Gene, which is uh, looking at uh, culinary history through the South and uh, his book. A, a lot speaks to uh, how you can sometimes not have so many records about things, but you can know about uh, the food, like say the fish pepper uh, being used by uh, African-American restaurants and people selling street foods and, and things, even though exactly how it came to be in that community is, a bit lost in history. Uh, and he has, uh, yeah, he, he does, he's been at, at the Heritage Festival at Monticello, which I hope someday we're gonna get to go to do uh, again, uh, teaching and sharing traditional uh, cooking and uh, variety. Uh, Oh, I told you I'd get back to that. What can I do? Well, one thing, if you aren't already saving seeds, consider the possibility of taking a variety and adopting it and uh, holding that uh, for everyone and find uh, out uh, about uh, what you can uh, about the diversity and the variety that uh, you have adopted. And when you share the seeds and share the food, share the stories so that those uh, seeds continue to have a place uh, in the hearts and kitchens of people. And honestly, as you go out, make sure that you support companies that support maintaining biodiversity in our seed, uh, in our seeds. Uh, I think we have one or two more and then we can get some of the questions because you guys are throwing them at me. The Cooking Gene, another book that I wanted to mention that uh, tells a little bit of it, 
a different part of the story of black food and farming in the South. Uh, Leah Pinner uh, and the folks at Soul Fire Farm wrote Farming While Black. And they really uh, have a little section in each area called Uplift that points out that uh, sometimes a narrative about black people it, it, is they, uh, the history books will show that people were taken from parts of Africa where say to go to the Carolinas where rice was grown and brought there uh, for their knowledge as well as their strength and uh, and then African uh, farming techniques, like, uh, as they say, you know, put soil uphill at a place to make, you know, uh, trellises, I mean, terraces and uh, using charcoal. There's so many things. Uh, yeah. So you might want to read that one, too. Oh, I wrote a book. This is a shameless commercial moment. Uh, I wrote uh, vegetable gardening in the southeast and uh, a series of six so far uh, books for individual states in the southeast. Uh, and really more if you're either new to gardening or new to the southeast, I think it can be of help. So why don't we go back to um michael and leah and leave that up as our final thing while we answer questions uh okay I Evan, thank, you. On me. thank you so very much that was so rich and full of information we all you also did a wonderful job uh reading the chat room so that a lot of those questions you've already answered um i did want to touch on a couple knowing that we only have a few minutes here um, so again, thank you for sharing uh, all of that information. Um, the first and perhaps most important question or series of questions had to do with how to cook collard greens. And some people asked about how to cook cow peas. One person had a review of uh, an experience eating collard greens that was not very positive. So do you have any like quick tips or suggestions on preparation of collard greens or um, cow peas? One of them is what I consider Brazilian style. And this is a quick uh, cooking. In Brazil, they generally cook it with garlic. You, you take some nice garlic, a, a, a little bit or a lot, according to if you really like it, Put it up fine, saute it in some olive oil until it's golden brown. And then you have, while you were, while you were uh, cooking that uh, garlic, you can take, you're well washed. You don't want any sand in your greens. Uh, and uh, de-stemmed uh, collard leaves, put about six of them in a row, roll them tight like a cigar, and then cut them in really thin strip, as they say, and uh, <laughs> cut those in half, put them in with uh, the garlic. Some people like to sprinkle a little water on it and put a lid over it and steam it. Some people like to stir it constantly because they like it drier. But one of those two ways, you're only going to cook it 10 or 15 minutes. And then they're still bright green, salted to taste, very delicious. And cutting them in that small, uh, those small strips takes uh, away a little bit of the toughness that you otherwise might feel. And um, Jamaica, they eat them as young greens rather than waiting for them to get old. They make salads out of them. That's uh, there. And then the other is traditional slow cooking. The thing about slow cooking that's going to make it good is uh, it's good to have a little bit of oil, either from or a really high quality oil like olive oil. Uh, and what you want to do is cook them slow and at a low temperature. If you cook them all that long time at a high temperature, they're kind of slimy and not so much to my taste. So those are the two ways I like them. Cow peas, kind of, uh, you know, I like them because you don't really need to uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Phil reminded us that collards cook down. So you start out with a whole lot more than you think you're going to need at the other end. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and quick on the crowder peas or black eyed peas, they don't have to be soaked, but they take less time to cook if they have been. Uh, boiling in water or other stocks for flavor. Oh, we lost. Uh oh. Well, this is a good time for me to thank everyone for being patient. We've had uh, some issues with video and audio, and no, nope, here she comes. Welcome oh. back, Tara. Yeah. Huh. Oh well, I'm so sorry. I knew. Not your fault. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, and again, uh, crowded peas. They're nice cooked with a little onions or garlic too. Very tasty. And they're different ones uh, that have different tastes of little lady peas, which are very delicate. Uh, you know, are big red rippers that are a little more robust and can be sometimes used in the way uh, to make refried beans even. But, uh, I know Phil is, is listening and uh, he had mentioned that um, there's a great recipe that you have that we might be able to uh, attach a link to the chat room. I don't know if anyone has, is that just in your book, Ira, or was he referring I, to? I think I put it maybe on the Heirloom College blog or gave it to Seed Savers for something. Oh, okay. I see Dare already uh, posted that. So it's, it's, in, it's in the chat room. Hopefully people can copy that. Great. <laughs> I meant to do that and I forgot all about it. Uh, but. I don't know what our cutoff is exactly. I suspect we only have a couple of minutes, but I wanted to mention a good way, I think, to wrap it up is a question we had from a gentleman named John, who asked, what help can we provide to spread stories of you and your work? Well, we that's a good question. You can uh, talk about the projects that are important to me, like Southern Exposure, Seed Exchange has a blog and I stick stuff on it. Uh, I uh, am a great friend of Seed Savers Exchange and try to stick my nose in there sometimes. <laughs> uh, uh, I've written a bunch of stuff for Mother Earth News over the years. I have some books. HeirloomCollards.org is uh, our project, our joint project uh, between uh, seed savers, uh, exchange and southern exposure and uh, utopian seeds and so many friends uh, who are making uh, heirloom collards be loved again. Great and sort of along those same lines of uh, asking what can be done to help, I going back to early in your presentation you you mentioned that USDA rules regulating farming, particularly with respect to black farmers, um, have been, have created uh, barriers in the past. And I'm wondering specifically what some of those barriers are. And when you say it's getting better, how is it getting better and what can citizens do to help? Uh, well, the things that are getting better is how the rules about uh, financing uh, are uh, and loans to farms. Uh, a lot of black owned land is held in what they call heirs property. That is multiple, you know, family members own some land undivided together. And they used to not be able to get And then uh, one of the 30 heirs could force the sale and uh, often some uh, white person who had cash would buy it for a, a, a song. And those rules are much uh, more evenly um, applied and uh, have gotten a little bit better. Uh, yeah, that's 
something that is there. And then uh, there is access to uh, special programs like high tunnels and stuff were limited for people in the area's property condition. Uh, and furthermore, before that, when I was young, uh, I know a black farmer friend of mine who worked sometimes with a white farmer and they would just send the white farmer in to get the loans and not even show their black face. So, uh, and hopefully that won't happen again. We all share that hope. Um, okay, I had a, a very specific question um, from uh, two of them that are specific to varieties. Uh, one from Tamsin saying, is there a historical record of research about Phaseolus vulgaris becoming a staple food in Africa, possibly through Portuguese slave traders taking dry beans from South America to Africa? There, there's not a strong, there's not a straight historical refer reference, but just what the person suggested is what many researchers conjecture from looking at bills of lading and stuff like that that it probably happened that way. Okay. Uh, and because of the particular kind of recipes that people use also uh, made for the Portuguese uh, connection. Okay. Um, a similar question from Elfas, would, who wants to understand the seed system in the United States better. I'm sure many people would like to. Uh, in Africa, in particularly Kenya, uh, the government is uh, in collaboration with multinational seed companies and they push for certified seeds, yet the certification process is not favorable to small farmers. How does that work in the U.S. and are seed certified is his question. Uh, well, we're lucky in that uh, the rules uh, are, are more loose about that kind of thing in the U.S. We're unlucky in that to get a bigger seed farm, you need a lot of uh, bigger operations favor multinationals who have a lot of money. So it's not so bad in some ways, and it's just as bad in other ways. Uh, fortunately, you can use your seed dollars to support uh, small and independent companies and help there be more uh, seed that's grown by small farmers. And of course, you can save seeds yourself. Very good. Lastly, and we just have a couple minutes now, we got a little extension there, but we're gonna be moving over to another session shortly. Um, when I first spoke with you, you alluded to some of your research at Monticello and it's uh, you know really revealed some fascinating pieces of history that don't get taught in Eurocentric American history classes. And so I personally love the story you shared about the Hemings brothers and wondered if you could talk about that for just a minute and maybe shed some light on how we uh, might rewrite American history uh, to tell the whole story. Well, uh, much of American history about food and uh, food in particular is actually as we speak hopefully being rewritten we just have to pay attention to it and the Hemings story is a complicated one uh which we won't get into all of it but uh, you can go to my you can go to uh, monticello.org and read some about it but the Hemings brothers James and Peter James as a 10 year old went to France with Mr. Jefferson and there and uh, served as his servant and then his cook. He trained under. Can you imagine this Henry who doesn't speak a word of France going to France, becoming literate, getting trained as a French chef? And one of the few pieces of his writing that still left was when he had worked his way by training his younger brother Peter to be a chef. Uh, into freedom uh, and the fact that they would love each other enough that the one would uh, take on the duties of the other so that one of them could be a free man. But anyway, uh, so James and uh, Peter Hemmings and also later Edith Fawcett 
and uh, Fanning Gillette, who they trained, uh, actually instilled that French cuisine using American uh, ingredients. And uh, they were allowed, uh, because of their position with Mr. Jefferson, to work independently in some other homes uh, in Richmond, as far away as Richmond, which was a long way then, uh, to train cooks in this uh, these new techniques. Not so. This was not intuitive cooking. This was using what was considered the best of French cuisine with the best of American ingredients to make uh, that fine table that was served at Monticello. Wonderful stories, and thank you. That's going to help us also uh, pay attention to and, and ultimately rewrite American culinary history, I think, making sure that the people who deserve credit for um, creating it uh, as we know it today uh, get, get that spotlight. So I think we have to wrap up, and um, so grateful uh, to have had this time, and we've had lots of people weigh in in the chat room, um, thanking you for sharing your time with us. And uh, I'm, again, so grateful. If you have any uh, final words, I, I do want to suggest that people move over to the next session, which is what I'm going to do shortly. Um, but any, any parting words for everyone, Ira? Well, thank you so much for coming. And what you're going to do is grow heirloom vegetables, save seeds, and uh, support those who do those things as well. Bye now. Bye everyone. Thank you.